So first, the harvest. There are hand and machine harvest operations. Here you can see two photos of hand harvest. And with hand harvest, there's an advantage of having the impression of a higher quality finished product, which isn't always the case, but certainly uh, hand harvest is mentally and emotionally associated with a higher quality wine product. As a seller of the grapes, you actually are selling the rachis at a pound price of the grapes because the rachis is going into the bins and you're getting paid your ton price for the rachis as well as the berries. Uh, they don't count that in. You actually get a pretty good price, uh, generally a much better price for hand harvest even though the customer's paying for not only the grapes but the rachis as well. Uh, but again, that's because you get a little bit more attention to the harvest, so they will skip over clusters that look bad. You can't skip over clusters when you're machine harvesting. They take everything, good, bad, and different. Um, the only thing you could possibly do, if you have a problem, you could send a crew through and clean up the bad stuff before the machine harvest comes in. So machine harvest is a little more, a little less, I should say, less uh, selective. It takes everything. And the last thing you really want to do is send a crew through to and pay for a crew to harvest all the bad grapes. The ideal situation is you have an excellent crop. You have so few bad grapes that it's not going to impact your product quality. It's just a, a teeny tiny fraction of your grapes have any problem. And so you just take it all. And machine harvesting is quicker, it's less expensive, although the machine to get started is excruciatingly expensive. It's still a wonderful uh, way to go. You have to have a trellis design and a vineyard itself, varieties and, and the layout of the land, et cetera, that can handle machine harvest. Some trellis designs, you have no choice. There, you can't machine harvest or some topography, it's too steep or there's a problem with the soil where it's just not safe to drive through certain vineyards with a machine harvester. So once you get the grapes harvested and weighed, now it's time to take them to the crush pad. Uh, you can see this corkscrew looking crush pad. Uh, this is a typical crush pad you would see at a modern winery. In the lower right, you can see uh, a little more detail of a smaller crush pad where the grapes are being fed in. Uh, you can see this blur. It looks like a flow of water, but it's blurry because the grapes are falling. There might be some juice in there, but there shouldn't be a huge amount. It's not like a flow of liquid. It, it's grapes that are falling in here with some liquid coming out the bottom. And it goes through this auger, this corkscrew auger that moves the grapes along. And as they're being moved along, they're gently getting crushed in a way that is not going to macerate the seeds or the uh, rachis. And when I say macerate, that's what we do when we chew our food. Chewing our food is maceration. It's breaking it up into small pieces to aid digestion and swallowing. And we macerate our food to break it all down. We don't want to break stems and seeds. It's gonna add bad flavors to the wine. So the crush is a gentle process trying to break open the individual berries to start releasing the juice without being too vigorous in the process where you would start to break open and release the seeds, macerating seeds, or getting too much of this woody flavor characteristics from the rachis. The old fashioned way, um, still done today for small uh, batches of wine in certain places or just uh, for fun. 
uh, the fortunate thing about the winemaking process is anything that might be on your feet is going to die in the process. Uh, athlete's foot does not survive in the winemaking process. So there, as much as some people look at this and go, ooh, somebody's toe jam in my wine, it actually is a very safe thing. There, there's nothing that would survive the alcohol fermentation process to cause you any harm whatsoever. So the pressing operation, once you have the crushed grapes, then you have to gently separate the grapes from the, the solids from the liquid. And so there are different fractions. The free flow is the juice that comes off first and it takes very little pressing. We call that the free flow. And there are advantages to it. Um, it has the least amount of solids, the least amount of potentially overpowering flavors from broken seeds or the rachis, if you did uh, hand harvest and the rachis is there. Um, now there is a de-stemming process, which you can do earlier. You might leave some rachis in, you might take it all out in a de-stemming process, which I didn't even mention yet. So how you do it, again, there's a choice. Do I take out the stems immediately from hand harvested grapes through de-stemming, or do I leave the rachis in there a little bit uh, for a period of time to add a tiny bit of character to the wine that would only come from the rachis. Choices. But after the free flow, you press a little bit harder. And when you press a little bit harder, you get more juice out, right? Makes sense. But as you're pressing a little bit harder, what are you doing? You're also squeezing those seeds a little harder and you're squeezing the skins a little harder. And so the flavors of skins and seeds start to get to be higher in the secondary press material, in the runoff of juice from the later parts of pressing. Is that what you want? Yeah, maybe. Do you want to maximize the amount of juice or do you want to reduce the potential negative flavors that might come out of the seeds and skins. If you've ever eaten grapes, seeded grapes, not the seedless, but if you've ever eaten seeded grapes, the skins are more sour, maybe a little bitter compared to the, the pulp, the inside of the grape. And if you bite into a seed, there's this astringent and sometimes nasty flavor that comes out of seeds. And a tiny bit of that actually can be good for the wine. Some people like that characteristic, especially in certain types of red wines. They want some characteristic from the, the uh, skins for sure. And they may want just a little bit of characteristic from the seeds, but how much? Depends on your product. What are you trying to make? What does the customer want? And the harder you press, the more skin and seed flavors you're going to get. So you might keep those things separate. The early free flow run, maybe a second press run, and then the final press run. Do you want to keep it too early late or early mid late? It depends. Again, what are you trying to do? do and they might go into different wines or blended differently because there is different flavors in the juice coming out of the press during different times and that sometimes is more complicated a lot uh, a lot of high volume winemakers they want a good grape get as much juice as they think is appropriate pressing as gently as possible to get the most juice without breaking seeds 
And there are so many different kinds. There are bladder presses where there's literally an inflated bladder, like a giant balloon with a thick, thick wall. And as that bladder is inflated, it presses the grapes inside the drum uh, of the bladder and the juice falls out. Um, this is a press, a wooden press that has this uh, device, a pressing device where you're literally just pushing down and it pushes a platform down, squeezing the grapes and the juice runs out the bottom. Uh, so again, lots of different styles. So once we're done pressing, now we've got juice. Um, and depending on the type of a wine you're making, you might leave the skins on for a while, while you're fermenting. You might take the skins out. So when are you gonna press? Are you gonna press before fermentation? In the middle of fermentation, after fermentation? Again, choices. I'm not showing you the operations in the necessarily exact order you're going to do them because each winemaker is going to change things on their own uh, for the needs of their production. And here you see something, I believe this is a picture in Shide Vineyards. Each one of these is an individual fermentation tank. And you can see the scale of this with this man here and his job is to connect hoses and pumps to move the fermented material to different areas for filtration, for um, uh, whatever operation they need to do. So you're going to go from fermentation to pressing perhaps to um, to a filtration station, to bottling, to whatever you're doing. You move that around through the warehouse to different stages using these hoses and special pumps that they wheel around on um, these pump carts. And that's what a cellar worker does. They move hoses and they move pumps and they pump wine from where one place to another. And some of these tanks can be uh, up to a quarter million gallons in some cases. I think the biggest one at Shide is 180,000 gallons, somewhere around there. Um, and 250,000 is, uh, is a quarter million. And I don't think Shide has anything quite that big, but there are some at, at wineries that are around that big, massive tanks. And you gotta do it right. If you have 100,000 gallons of something, that's worth a lot of money. And if that fermentation goes bad, you've got problems. Maybe like this, this young lady down here, I'm having fruit salad for dinner. Well, it's mostly grapes. Actually, okay, all grapes, fermented grapes. I'm having wine for dinner. <laughs> anyway, I do encourage you to drink responsibly, but if you're going to drink, drink Monterey County wine. It's good for you. It's good and it supports our local economy. Um, so, winery operations, there's the aging and blending. So once I have uh, a finished product or semi-finished product, I can put it in barrels for aging and leave it there for some period of time. It gets the characteristics of the wood in the barrels. There are other ways to age where you can use stainless steel tanks, which are easier to clean and last longer. And instead of the wooden flavor that you're getting from the wood, you take wood slats and put them inside the wine. So instead of it being in a barrel with the wood on the outside, you put wood staves or wood slats or even wood chips, wood powder, whatever it takes, into the wine steel tank. And that's going to give you the same wood flavor, theoretically, without the expense of these uh, custom-made 
barrels from France frequently. They have the best tasting oak, according to many wine aficionados. Uh, the oak of California makes some great barrels, but some people say the flavor is a little sharper and doesn't have the character that uh, is necessarily ideal for some people's tastes. But again, it's all about tastes. Um, once you've aged things, you take some sampling, you test it, uh, you make an estimate for, for red wines, how long is this supposed to be aged after we sell it? Some bottles of wine are intended to be consumed right away within the next several months. Uh, things you would get at the grocery store probably are in that category. Some higher end wines are expected to be stored in the bottle with the consumer for a number of years to be opened at a later time. And so it, the flavor at the time it's sold is not yet fully matured. The flavor will age or change over time to be consumed at a later date. How the heck do you know that if you're not a wine enthusiast? That's one of the challenges of the industry. How, how do customers know? Uh, it's one of the oddball things in terms of um, the things that we drink. Hard liquors, you buy it, you drink it. And it lasts a long time in the bottle, so you don't have to worry about it. Beer, you buy it, you drink it. It doesn't last quite as long. Uh, some people store it longer than it should be. Beer gets kind of funky in the bottle. Um, you should drink it within a matter of a few months. Um, it's not made to be sitting around and aging. Um, so you don't think about that type of thing as a consumer. You buy it, you drink it. Is that true for wine? It depends. And that confuses consumers. So when you're doing the aging of wine in barrels, you want to have low temperatures kept cool. That's why we have wine cellars or wine caves. Um, the cave is where the wine is being aged. And so literally wine is stored in caves, either natural or man-made holes dug in the earth where it stays cool all the time. If you're in a cave, a true cave, a lot of caves are constantly at, you know, 50, 52, 54 degrees, and it just stays there. It's not really refrigerator cold, but it's very, uh, very cool. And that's perfect for aging of many wines. Um, so just using the earth as an insulator can be great. But you do want higher humidity because you don't want too much moisture, which will go through the barrels. You don't want too much moisture being lost through the barrels and it, it maintains a proper aging environment. And the barrels can actually fail if they get too dry, um, which isn't gonna happen when they're full, but you don't want uh, to dry out the empty barrels either too much. I'm gonna take a quick break. <laughs> 